Peter Ispan speaking to you from the small city of our town, rather, of Perry Sound, Ontario. So Perry Sound is located about two hours north of Toronto, in affectionately called Cottage Country. There's uh, the largest uh, archipelago, I think, I'm not sure if it's the largest archipelago in the world, uh, but certainly it's a large one, but there's 30,000 islands, so it's a very popular place in the summer for people coming from Toronto because of all the lakes and people have summer homes and cottages and things like that. So I grew up in Toronto and uh, as for as long as I can remember, my dad always had a, a camera around. I mean, he was, his occupation was, a, he was a physician, obstetrician, gynecologist, but his hobby was, which at the time, well, it was a hobby, was of uh, photography. And uh, I still remember very well with excitement when he would come home with uh, the new slides. You know, I'm really dating myself, but slides. And one of my jobs was to run around uh, and grab the slide, uh, the screen, the screen that we set up in our, our living room and projector. And then, of course, there was always the stress of making sure that the slides were put in the upside the right way. So when they projected it on the, the screen, they were the right side up. But so I think it's probably through my dad that I became interested in photography. And as long as I can remember, I've uh, had a camera of some kind uh, taking photos I seem to have gravitated towards taking pictures of people, even if I think of some of my early photographs way back, way back when. I was interested in people and capturing them in a, a moment that would be expressive of the, the time, their personality, and what they were experiencing at the time. So try and capture that in a moment. I mean, I certainly like taking pictures of uh, animals too, uh, but it's just different technology. But I think I, I certainly gravitate towards people. And then also over more recent years, uh, people in, in an action. So for example, the, my daughter's ski team, I really enjoyed, I don't know if she enjoyed it, but I enjoyed the following around and taking pictures of the meets that she competed at or some of the local bike events that we have here in Prairie Sound. So it's capturing those action shots and, we're, we're always exciting as well, but it's, so it's people in the, people in either still or just uh, talking or in action, I certainly gravitate towards. This provides a wonderful place to, as the expression goes, to live, work and play. And through the four seasons, I was just chatting with someone just a few minutes before we got started this interview, but uh, we just love the four, we have the four distinct seasons here in Perry Sound and just with each one comes some new kind of joy, but spring is particularly an energizing season with uh, everything growing or starting to grow and just longer days uh, in the winters. So, I mean, summertime is just filled with uh, great summer days by the beach or in the water. And uh, as I mentioned, one of the reasons it's such a popular place up here is um, because of all the different islands that uh, people can explore right on Georgian Bay, but then also there's so many just lakes where people have their, their cottages. But winter, winter brings a whole other sort of exciting element to living in Perry Sound that uh, is enjoyed uh, by cross-country skiing. We have some fantastic ski trail system, as well as uh, fat biking. So fat biking is on a bike with larger tires that uh, and there's great trails to groom and just really embracing what the winter can offer. And snow, I, I don't do it, but a lot of people do snowmobiling as well. So with each season living up here in Perry Sound, we can experience nature at its finest, whether it be the winter season or the, the trees or in the summertime, but just it's just full of vibrancy through each season as we go through the year, which makes it a great place to live.
Photography for me is, is something I've been doing for quite some time, but it's uh, currently a side business that I put 150% passion into it because I enjoy it so much. And uh, over the next couple of years, I can certainly see it evolving into perhaps just a full-time thing that I, that I am engaged with. In the field of photography, obviously there's different things that a photographer can focus on or get involved with. Weddings, for example, family portraits, pet photography, boudoir photography, real estate. I mean, there's a long list of different uh, aspects of photography that a photographer can do. And some photographers should do all of them, for sure. So what I focus on is uh, headshots. So typically from your, your chest up, as you've seen and probably will show. And I mean, some people absolutely just need a headshot for whatever. Maybe it's for the website, maybe it's for their their marketing brochure, for their business card or whatever. And it's just a, you know, it's just like going to the dentist, they need a headshot, they got to go get their teeth clean. Uh, and that's it. However, for some, it's really, and what really makes it exciting for me, and I'm very, is the transformative effect that having a good photo of someone can have. So I'll, I'll give you an example. And uh, this doesn't happen for every client by any stretch, but it happens for enough that makes it it's sort of like golf. If you hit a good shot and keep golfing, despite the fact that I'm a hacker, uh, but this one good shot keeps me going. So in photography, so there's one client I had uh, not too long ago, and she was uh, going through a lot of life changes. She had a, just ended the, doesn't sound like a very good uh, relationship. She had moved to a new part of uh, Ontario. She started a new job. And part of what she wanted to do was evolving and growing herself into a different part of her time of her life. And one of that, one of those was uh, capturing herself in a photo. What was really amazing about this experience that I had with her is uh, one of her hands had a deformity that she was born with. And uh, she said, you know, if there's a way I can incorporate this hand in the photo sometime, then that would be great. So, I, you know, at the time I said, sure, not really knowing what that would look like. And we did, uh, we started the process uh, that I have and we went through a bunch of different uh, poses and expressions and had some good laughs along the way. She had a great sense of humor, that helps. And at one point she just started adjusting her hair, not my hair, obviously her hair with uh, her hand that uh, had this deformity and I started capturing some photos and they turned to be really very natural photos of her having her hand in, in the photo. And then, I mean, it may not sound funny now, but at the time it was sort of a fun thing where I said, okay, well, give me, give me the finger. Right. And so she did this with her, her good hand. Um, that didn't, and then I said, no, the other one. And it, we just had a great powerful moment when she was holding up her hand that uh, had this deformity, but she was, you know, giving me the finger. And then after the process, or after the photo shoot, we had taken in the photos, we went, we go through a selection process. And at the very end, she said, you know, this was one of the most empowering experiences I've had in a long time. And I'm just very grateful for that. And she also said that, you know, and this is the first time I've allowed somebody to take a photo of her hand. That kind of experience when I first got into headshot photography, I was attracted to the images, but that part of being able to help someone or transform in just a small little way, their confidence in themselves to feel good about themselves was uh, a pretty incredible uh, experience and for me. I have a great, thankfully I've got a great peer or series of mentors to help me and I certainly followed with one of probably the greatest headshot photographers, uh, Peter Hurley, who's based out in New York. And one of his expressions, it goes something like, I aim for the face, but I shoot for the heart when he's taking a photo. And it, it brings to light the purpose of most of the headshot sessions. And it really is being able to connect with someone. Generally speaking, most people do not like having their fo photo taken. They don't like standing in front of camera. They think they're going to break the camera. You know, they don't like all the, anything on their faces because uh, people spend a lot of time in front of the mirror looking. And it's just not a pleasant, uh, they, 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 don't, they just don't want to do it. Uh, so being able to connect with someone in a very short time, it's, it's not like I have a lot of time to get to know someone before. But being able to have a real 
connection with them in a meaningful way to create an image that they're, I mean, ultimately they need to be happy with it. I mean, I like images for different reasons, but they need to be the ones who really like it. And, you know, that's a reflection if they share it, for example, if they feel, if they get to a point where they're comfortable enough to share it, then that's great. But then then they don't necessarily have to share it, but it's just that transformative effect. It just came to mind another example. Uh, I had a client, Part of the process is I take some photos and I'm hooked up to a laptop and all that means is that I can bring them around and I can show them the photos that we're capturing. Well, I had taken maybe about 10 photos of this client and then I brought her around and said, hey, come come look over capturing. She came over, she stared at it for a moment and then she literally burst out in tears. And I was, I was a little confused at the moment because I thought she was, oh my God, she hates these photos, but she was just, she couldn't believe how, what she looked like with, you know, some proper lighting and good photo. And it, again, it was just this little transformative uh, moment that I had with this client, which was, I mean, it's special. It's part of that. To make someone feel comfortable enough to tell you what's, what's, what's up with them in, in the role of a physician. But then as a physician, you're trying to get to a diagnosis probably faster uh, I mean, I'm not trying to get to a diagnosis when I'm trying to take a headshot of someone. I'm trying, just trying to get to know them. So it's connecting with them. At the end of the day, it's just communication and asking questions and showing genuine interest in, in them, their story, the things they're talking about. If I, if I don't know them, uh, because I live in a small town, certainly sometimes I know people either directly or indirectly. But if, I, if uh, someone came to my studio, that I've never met before. I mean, there is some initial communication via email, so I get to know them a little bit. But it's uh, it's sitting down and just chatting with them. It's not uh, it's not come in here, stand behind me, we start taking photos. It's just uh, spending maybe five ten minutes just talking to them a little bit, getting to know them, and connecting with them as a from one human being to another human being, and just to get them uh, to relax a little bit and feel comfortable feel comfortable with me. They're probably not going to feel comfortable with them taking the photos. I mean, as I said earlier, a lot of people don't like taking or having their photo taken, but the good news is I love taking photos. So we cancel, we cancel each other out. So it usually results in a, a very positive experience for people. Yeah, I'll just, uh, it's sort of a booth, but it's, uh, it's my setup. I have uh, three different lights. It's not really a booth per se, but there's three different flashes that uh, flash them that I set up in a triangle kind of setup uh, when I'm taking photos. And what it does is it hits them with a wave, a person with a wave of light. Uh, and then, I mean, light is, I mean, you can create any kind of photo with uh, light, depending on how you set it up, things like that. But for the, the images that uh, perhaps you've seen on my website, it's, there's three lights set up. So when I press the shutter, three flashes go off and there's a wave of beautiful light that um, makes people look awesome. It's going to take me, well, it's, it's, and, and it's, it's going to continue for years and years and years. So it's not like I've arrived. Uh, I've arrived at a point where at least I, I feel pretty confident being able to take a good photo with someone. But I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm associated with uh, Peter Hurley's, uh, and he has a group called Headshot Photographers, which are photographers connected through throughout the world, actually, uh, which has been great. So it provides a great, great opportunity for me to learn from other photographers. So through that network, I spent a lot of time to talking, learning, watching, listening, uh, and just uh, surround myself with people who, who have the knowledge and are willing to help. And that's been a great, uh, fortunately for me, a uh, great uh, opportunity to embrace the education and experience of others. So to answer your question specifically, I, I got more into headshot photography, well, I guess it was around 2018. So I've been working on it. Uh, since then, and it's just something I continue to work on. And you know, while you can't see in my studio, but I have this fake head on that. Well, it's either my, I'm taking a lot of selfies because <laughs> not, not, not in the sense of being vain, but just to practice the lighting, to practice the little tweaks, to practice the editing. And uh, yeah, it's, it's consistent, consistent ever over years and to get me to this point. But it's again, it's not like I've arrived. I have a lot more to, more to go for sure.
a the equipment it helps, but uh, I mean you can you can create amazing. I mean, look at how good our our the phone the cameras on our phones are. Um, and you know, going back to something I said earlier, it's not the it's not the necessarily the equipment that captures the magic in a photo. It's the ability to connect with a person. So, um, you know, a few years ago, uh, in locally, I was asked just as a little side story. There was uh, a group putting on some. They're putting on show us your best winter photos. It was a, just an evening to celebrate, and they invite about five photographers to, to share the best images. And when I started going through that, okay, well, what are my best images? It's actually started to become a very perplexing question for me because it depends. Like there's some images that are technically, and by technically I mean like exposure, lighting, color, or whatever, are terrible. But because it's a, a photo of, let's say, my grandmother, it's a really special photo. Or if there's a, a photo, you know, I'm just thinking of some of the photos of a picture of a bunch of kids, they're laughing, they're smiling. Again, maybe not at the best technical photo, but the joy and the vibrancy that you can feel from looking at that photo makes it an awesome photo. So it is a little bit of the perception of who's actually looking at the photo. Is it a good photo? So this is a long-winded answer to your question about the lenses and the portrait. It really is less about the equipment um, because anybody can, I mean, really, anybody can take a good photo with good equipment, but it's more about uh, creating the, the, the story behind the photo, which is where the art is really in the photography. It's not, it's not, you know, if you have a 50, 50 mil zoom lens or, or whatever, it's really the, uh, everything behind it that creates the awesome image um, for people to look at. I got more into this, the business side of photography by helping a friend do weddings. Uh, a few years ago, I was called what's a second shooter. So second shooter just means she was a primary photographer. I mean, she was the one dealing with her clients, getting paid, and I would just go and help her for fun. So I would lug her equipment around, and once it was set up, then I could take uh, some candid photos. I would never want – I mean, hats off to any wedding photographer out there because that is a difficult – that's a difficult uh, gig to do, uh, and that's something I'm not interested in doing myself. But I have been involved with them, but just as uh, in that role as a second shooter. How did I get to bees? Well, I blame my friend, Cam, because uh, it was about uh, eight years ago now. He, one summer, he said, uh, hey, you should get bees. Said, all right. Um, all right. I didn't know what that meant. I mean, I knew what it meant, but it was like, oh, okay, sure, I'll try that. So it was really just on the whim that a friend of mine introduced me to beekeeping. And uh, that summer, I, was, I think it was about eight years ago, started I remember it was on July 1st, so Canada's national holiday, because that was the day I could pick up the bees from. So getting bees to get started, there's a couple different ways, but one of them is essentially going to like a pet store for bees, where you buy, you get a box that's really, you know, it's this, it's about one, one and a half feet um, by, I don't know, five or six inches. And in that, in, there's four, there's frames, which you may have seen some of the photos of. So we call those square things frames. And uh, when you buy the, your first set of bees, the, you get uh, four of those frames. There's about 3,000 live bees on there. And then there's a bunch of unborn bees. And then there's some honey uh, in the frames. And then there's one queen bee. Queen bee and that's what uh, gets you started to, into beekeeping. And so that's been an incredible journey in itself, uh, being involved with beekeeping. And there's, well, there's, it's been a lot of fun. But that's how I got started, through a friend. Uh, they don't follow plans too well. So uh, <laughs> they, I've used a couple of different techniques uh, for them. And there's some pretty fascinating techniques that other photographers and uh, have shown. But uh, I mean, really just standing out in front of the hive, uh, just thinking about the lighting, I mean, primarily where the sun is and how it's hitting the hive or not hitting the hive. And then at different times of the day, there, there's different activity, getting to know the bees in that way. You know, the different activities. Um, often, I mean, many of the photos, uh, sometimes it's just, as I mentioned earlier, cell phones are pretty good. So during a bee inspection, I'll pull out my cell phone and just take a couple of photos just to capture what I'm seeing uh, so I can help 
me remember something later. I, I like taking photos of the queen bee when you see her. That's what, not always the case when you're opening up a hive. But so it's just it's, it's not that complicated. Um, but it's been fun to capture uh, bee key, bees for sure. Yes, so bees are very good about finding food. They 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 have about uh, they fly typically from their hive, so those boxes. Uh, generally, their range is about uh, three to five kilometers, so that they they would go foraging foraging for food. In um, at this time of year, March being where we live in in Perry Sound, they'll actually start uh, bringing back pollen from some of the things that first start uh, budding like maple trees or pussy willows and things like that. But to answer your question in the winter, so it depends when you ask that question, you gotta make sure it depends on where you are in the world. So here in Perry Sound in the North and most of Ontario, uh, what we do in the fall, there's a couple of things that happen in beekeeping and some of this may or may not be interesting. But one of the things that the hive does, so the hive being all the bees, in about uh, late September, October, in preparation for the winter, because they know winter is coming too, they start um, they start kicking out all the male the male bees. So in a beehive, there's th there's three main bees, and uh, you know, just to give you some numbers here, in a full hive in the summer. There's one queen bee. There's always just one queen bee. Generally, there's reasons there may be more than one, but there's one queen bee. There's 50 to 60,000 female bees, and then there's about two to 3,000 male bees. So we call them male bees or drones. So back to October, what happens is the hive starts kicking out the male bees, and literally it's kicking them out to their death because they're not, uh, not going to survive over the winter outside of the hive. So why do they do that? Well, they do that because the male bees during the they they actually don't do much in the hive. Their their f sole function in the world of beekeeping is to mate with a queen. So the hive from the hive's perspective, this is a resource issue that they don't want the males around in the hive during the winter eating up their hive. So out they go, and they are go to their death. Now another thing that commonly beekeepers in this area, and again just emphasizing that in this area Ontario. We feed our bees some sugar water during the fall. So why do we do that? Well, that's just to help increase the stores of the honey that they have in their hives. I mean, bee keep, bees are making the honey not for us as humans. I mean, we enjoy that a lot, but they're making it as their food source. So bees eat uh, primarily two things, the honey, which is their carbohydrate, and then pollen, which they collect as their protein. So we feed them. We feed them in late September, October. We start feeding them a lot of, or not everybody, but some people do. Myself included. Start feeding them sugar water and usually a two to one ratio, and that allows the bees to convert that quickly to a, a honey source. So honey, honey is a result you're familiar with uh, maple syrup, likely. So at this time of year is a great time for maple syrup. People where they're, they're harvesting sap from maple trees, and you may recall the sap from maple trees has to be boiled down from a 40 to 1 ratio. So similarly, bees, are they're not collecting honey from flowers, obviously. They're collecting nectar. They bring it back to the hive, and then they have to go through an evaporate. The, the nectar has to go through an evaporation process, essentially, to reduce it down to about a 17 18% water content, and that's when it's honey. And uh, so when we feed, so back to the, sh we feed them sugar water at a two to one ratio, and that just speeds up that process for them to convert it to honey. So then during the winter, there's a couple other things we do. Uh, we, cut, we wrap them, and that's really more to um, provide a windbreak uh, from the minus uh, 20, um, minus 20 winds or can, or can be. But what happens in the in the hive itself, if you can imagine, it's like the march of the penguins. There's a ball within. There's a ball of bees in the hive. And so in the center of that ball is the queen bee. And uh, what the rest of the hives are doing, or what the rest of the bees, excuse me, are doing, is um, much like you and I. When if we get cold, we shiver. And what? Why we shiver? We shiver to generate heat. So what the what the muscle what the other bees are doing is they're shivering and because of the way their anatomy is that their their wings are slightly attached detached or the, the connection to their thorax is they can they can vibrate or shiver their thorax muscles and the purpose is to generate heat 
and the heat keeps the queen warm. So when it's minus 30 Celsius outside in Perry Sound, right around the queen, it's plus 30 Celsius. And that's how they keep her warm. So they don't, so the bees here, they don't fly south for the hibernate in, in Florida. They don't hibernate and go to sleep, but they're actively, I mean, it's a fight for survival, basically. And as you can imagine, this ball of queen or the ball of bees, the outside ones, I mean, they're die just because they're not, they can't stay warm enough. And so it's a fight for survival during the winter. Either, I mean, a couple of things are factors into that. A, there has to be enough honey for them to get through the winter like, because that's their food source. And there has to be enough bees in that initial ball going into the summer, into the winter where that they can sustain the amount of, you know, natural death that's going to happen. And it's quite a remarkable thing on a, on a winter, on a warm winter day, most typically in January or February, if the sun is out and it's really, uh, really kind of well above zero, what you'll see in front of your hive is an, another reason why you know, probably know the expression, don't eat well yellow snow, because the bees, they'll exit uh, and they'll go to the bathroom uh, and they'll take this opportunity. So there's one time I remember in particular, I went out uh, just looking and it was, it was like the snow had turned yellow. And so the reason they do that is because they tend not to go to the bathroom in their hive. Uh, they wait, they hold it, they wait, literally, and they go flying out on these warm winter days and go in the hive. So that poses a problem if, if it's a really cold, long winter, and because they don't go out and do that. And then, there, and then there's been reports of uh, bees dying of dysentery because they can't go to the bathroom. So going into the winter is not the, I mean, it's not the best time for beekeeping. So what we do is we, you know, going back to all those sort of things I mentioned, you know, come November, we've wrapped them, we've given them enough food, and then we just really cross our fingers and hope for the best over the next, because you can't, you can't really do any interventions over the winter. Like, you, well, I guess you could, but it usually wouldn't end up well, where you open the hive, for example, and feed it something, because what happened, what, what potentially could happen is they get into this, this ball formation that I mentioned. And if you open up the hive, let's say on Christmas day, the bees are going to get all confused about that, uh, potentially. And then it'll, what will happen is they'll break that ball. It'll break, sort of the pattern they're used to, and then you know, likely it's just gonna die. So again, in, in here in Ontario where, where I live, we wrap them in November, and then it's only about now that we start um, looking in or potentially looking in. So at this time of year, March, what we could do is, um, is we could start feeding them again, just to give them an initial food source for the next couple of weeks. Is this is a bit of a dicey time as well because we haven't had a couple warm days, so the bees kind of wake up a little bit more, so to speak. And hey, maybe spring is coming, but then if we get a few more really cold days, and, and then there's no food around because because uh, not much, or at least right now is today, April, we, April, April 9th. We haven't had too much uh, blooming if you had a long cold winter. So this time again is a little dicey, so it's a little better. Uh, when the, for example, the dandelions start blooming, that's a, a good sign that things are okay. So that was a long answer to your question of what happens in the winter. <laughs> they die. And um, so then you might think, well, well then how do we get male bees around here? Well, so just to talk a little bit about that. The, the, queen, the queen bee um, in her abdomen, she has, uh, well, she's got a longer abdomen and hopefully some of the photos that I sent you, you'll see she's got a little longer abdomen. And so in there, there's two sacs. One has sperm, one has eggs. So when she, uh, so she has the ability to lay an unfertilized egg or a fertilized egg. The unfertilized egg turns into a male bee and the fertilized egg turns into a female bee. So this time of year, assuming she made it, assuming the hive makes it through the winter, she'll start laying eggs in her hive and she'll either lay, just as I mentioned, an unfertilized egg or a fertilized egg. So the, fertil the unfertilized egg turns into the male bee. So she'll start regenerating the male population right now. And then during the summer, well, here's a question for you. How many eggs do you think she lays uh, a day in the summer when it's full on capacity? 100. 100. Well, it's more, it's more like uh, 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day in the summertime. <laughs> so she's busy. Uh, so this, at this time of year, she's ramping up. 
So that's how the hive, so the kick baby may be out in the, um, in the fall. And then now this time of year, she'll start some laying the unfertilized internal males. But then you might ask, well, why do, we, why do we even need the male bees around in the first place? Well, as I mentioned, their one function is mating. So just to talk a little bit about that. If, uh, and the best way to th talk about this is to give you an example. So let's say my next hive inspection, um, and what I mean by hive inspection is I'm actually taking the lid off, I'm lifting out the frames, I'm looking, I'm inspecting, and uh, I do that, well, it depends, but I, I, that's what I mean by hive inspection. So let's say I was doing a hive inspection and for, what, for whatever reason, I, I accidentally killed the queen bee. Perhaps I didn't see her, I squished her accidentally. What happens is the hive within about 15, 20 minutes would recognize because there's a lot of pheromones, perfume, that kind of chemical, they would recognize in about 15, 20 minutes, there isn't a queen bee anymore. So panic would, ensue, panic would ensue in the hive. And what they would get, they would say, okay, well, uh, that's a bit of a problem, but we need, to, uh, we need to make another queen. So how do they do that? Well, they would run around, scurry around the hive, and they would look for an egg that has just recently hatched, maybe two or three days, or, or even a young egg that was just that was just laid maybe one or two or two or three days ago. And they would uh, they would play the odds. So, okay, it's this egg over here, this egg over here, this egg over here. These eggs, we are going to designate them as the next queen queen bees in the hive. So, how do they do that? Well, after about two, uh, two or three days, the, the egg hatches into a larvae. And then all larvae in the beginning phases of their life, they get what's called, you've probably heard this term before, royal jelly. So royal jelly is uh, basically a mixture of uh, pollen, honey, and other bee enzymes and things that the bees create. I mean, it's been well studied. And of course, you can buy it in the store and it'll cure everything that ails you, but that's a whole other story. So these, these, uh, these larvae get um, uh, this royal jelly. Now, all bees, as I mentioned, all the, all the larvae get royal jelly when they start, but these ones that they designated as to be queen bees, they get, they get uh, this royal jelly through their whole larvae stage. And just as another little side point, to give you a sense of how quickly the larvae grow, so the, in five days from when, after they've hatched to they've grown larvae, they're growing at an incredible rate. And the, the analogy is in the human terms, if a baby was born, let's say a nine pound baby boy or girl, in five days, it would be the size of an elephant. So that's how quickly those larvae are growing, relatively speaking, in the hive. Okay, so the hive has picked these five, six uh, queens, they develop them, uh, and then uh, they emerge as queens. Now, here's where it becomes a little... Uh, survival of the fittest. So the first queen bee out of that emerges, develops and emerges, will go around and kill all the other queen bees because she wants to be the queen. But she's she's emerged, so she's killed all the other queen bees, but she's a virgin queen bee. So what does she do? Well, she this is the one, there's a couple times uh, that a queen bee will leave a hive, and this is one of them. So this she needs to go on what's called a mating flight. So she'll fly away from the hive, and as the name implies, a mating flight, all the male bees from that hive and any other hive around, so it's not just those ones, will track her down. And this is why the male bees have super big eyes, relatively speaking, compared to the other female bees. And they'll fly after her and they'll mate with her. And so she typically mates with about uh, 15 to 20 different male bees. And this is the moment of glory for the male bee. Right after they mate with, the, if they're lucky enough to mate with a queen, all their bits fall off and then they die. So they die in a moment of glory, so to speak. So she'll, she'll go on one or two different mating flights. And, and this is how, as I mentioned, I mean, she's born with the eggs, but this is how she, her, her, her sac that has sperm is, is filled up. So she'll come back to the hive and then that's when she starts this process of um, laying eggs. And so in Canada, at least where we live, a queen bee, assuming good health, can live between uh, two to four years. It depends on a few different factors. So that's, again, sort of a long answer to your question, how do the males, that's their function, is the mating. So in the hive, so we talked about the queen bee. I mean, her main function is uh, laying eggs. Uh, the, the male bees, their main function or purpose in the hive is to mate with a virgin queen. So what do the other bees do? So the other bees are worker bees or the female bees. And again, they're, they're, they're 
a queen bee lays a fertilized egg and they emerge as a queen or a female bee. So they, they go through a couple of different phases in their, in their life cycle, depending on their age. So the first thing that they do is they actually clean the cell. So they emerge, and this is the message I was trying to tell my kids. You know, the first thing you should do in the morning when you wake up is clean your room. That over the, the, the over so well sometimes. But they clean their cell in preparation for the next egg that's coming in. So then they go through that, and then they become uh, what's called a nurse bee. So the what and what that implies is that what they what they do is they help to feed the larvae that are growing in the hive. And then after about 10 days, uh, they develop glands at the back of their, their thorax and secretes a liquid. And that liquid turns into the honeycomb that we all know. And that, hun- that liquid and the honeycomb is what they build their, their hives uh, with. And that's, um, you can envision the honeycomb structure. That's what they're building. And then l- later on, they become uh, defense bees. So what they'll do is they'll line up at the at the entrance of the hive and they'll defend the hive from anything that wants to come in. So I remember this one time I watched a wasp land on the, where the bees enter and then it walked in and then in the minute it sort of rolled out, out the hive like a marble because it was covered in these honeybees defending the hive. And then the last phase of life for a honeybee is um, the ones that you see on your flowers. These are the foragers. These are the ones going out to collect the pollen, collect nectar. And actually another thing they collect is tree resin. And they bring the tree resin back to the hive and they use that uh, as, and they convert it into a substance called propolis. And propolis is like super glue of all super glues. And what they do with that is they seal any cracks in their hive uh, with uh, this propolis to make it uh, airtight for, for themselves. And then, so during the summer time, this life cycle I just described about female worker bees is about six weeks. So they live in a, six weeks in the summertime. Now that's different than the winter because uh, in, the, in the September, going back to the winter scenario, in September, October, the queen bee, she's laying, she may, well, it's, October, she's probably stopped by then, but she lays a different kind of bee, basically. It's like a winter bee that is going to get through the winter. But in the summer, the female bee is, uh, the life cycle is about six weeks. Mm-hmm. A couple of different snares there. Uh, in the contamination parts, it's not so much contaminated. Well, two aspects to answer that. One is um, there's something called robbing. And what they'll rob, if they, for whatever reason, if one hive senses another hive is weak, and a week could be uh, the bees are unwell or there's just not a large population uh, for whatever reason, then what they'll do is they'll go in there and they'll rob the honey. So they'll go in there, they'll take all the honey out and bring it back to their hive. So that's kind of a robbing uh, scenario. A contamination, well, in, in that terms, when you bring up that term, I, I start thinking about infection control issues or uh, pest control. The, uh, the bane of all beekeepers across the world is something called a varroa mite, which is a it's a small pest or pest that uh, it's a blood sucker. It um, you know on human size, uh, you know, you know in, in comparative speaking, it's probably about the size of this book. So imagine if I had this book st- stuck on my shoulder and uh, it was a parasite, it was sucking my blood. I'm probably not going to feel too good. So these varroa mites, they travel with the bees. So in your example of contamination, if there was a one hive nearby that had a lot of these varroa mites and some of the bees migrated over to the, that other hive, in that sense, it, the hive would be contaminated uh, from an infection control point. But it's more likely the case where I first mentioned is the robbing where you know, one hive is uh, going to the other hive to take their hive. I mean, beekeeping is, uh, if you read everything about beekeeping, the things could kill bees. If you read everything like before you had children, that it could kill your children, you never have children. So they, absolutely, there's lots of things that can, uh, that can be bad for bees. There's lots of infections, there's lots of bugs, parasites, et cetera, et cetera. But where I live, I'm lucky that there's not a lot, there's very, there's zero to little agriculture around. So about an hour south of here, the Barry, where there is our agriculture, uh, that, that's where the pesticides and issues can become an issue for uh, beekeeping. But thankfully, I don't have to worry about um, 
uh, pesticides from agriculture. What I do need to worry about, though, is where we live is uh, other things like uh, natural predators, uh, skunks, raccoons, uh, and bears. Actually, uh, people, I live in town, in, in town, relatively speaking, where I live. We uh, don't see bears often, although we have a few years ago when it was a really uh, dry summer. Bears were in town. It was unbelievable. But uh, people just outside of town, if they have bees, they have to they have to have an electric fence. So we don't have to worry about uh, pesticides per se here. It's more some of those natural predators. And, you know, bears, uh, bears, um, you've, you know, it's a classic Winnie the Pooh thing where they're, you think the bears are actually after the honey. Of course, they will eat the honey because it's sweet and delicious. But what they're really after is actually the unborn bees, the larvae, because it's a really protein rich source for them. So that's, that's really what they're after. Of course, they eat the honey because it's like dessert. But the main meal is certainly would be the, the larvae. That's like probably as a result of this pandemic, there's going to be a lot of puppies or cats up for sale afterwards. It seemed like a good idea at the time. I mean, beekeeping, it's not a lot of work, but there is work involved. You know, it is an animal and it is, I mean, well, I mean, it's, sorry, it's an insect. It, under, in Ontario, it's considered, it's uh, considered livestock uh, by our rules, by the governing bodies and things like that. So you have to take care of it. And there is some work, there is, it's not a lot of work, but there's some things you need to do, uh, particularly around, um, I guess, better if someone, I mentioned earlier this varroa mite. Well, this is a real problem for beekeepers. So if, if for example, someone got into beekeeping because they thought it was a cool idea, oh, I can get some honey, but they didn't take care of the varroa mites, this is a real problem for any of the other beekeepers around them that have bees, and this is their livelihood. Because, you know, back to the question you asked earlier about contamination, this is where a problem can happen. Because what happens is then if, it, if you buy the bees and you don't take care of these rural mites, they're going to kill your hive and it potentially could kill the surrounding hives of beekeepers that are trying to make a living from doing this. So that's where the problem is. And there's a, um, I think it's out west, there's a beekeeper. I mean, one of the, or he's got a huge operation, like thousands of hives. But one of the things he does is he puts on these courses regularly for people who are interested in beekeeping to learn about the infectious control part of beekeeping. Because, I mean, to him, he's interested in because he doesn't want a bunch of, you know, first-time beekeepers who wake up one day and think it's a good idea. Let's save the bees, but then create actually more of a problem by doing that. So how do you support a bee if you don't want to be in a beekeeper? I mean, there's a couple of things you can do. One is uh, you can plant stuff. That's a good thing. Uh, just uh, in your, if you can, in your, wherever you live, if you can, great. If you can't, that's fine too. Uh, you can support the industry by buying honey from or products from these local beekeepers. So that's a way you can support them. And, you know, yourself uh, or a person not using pesticides too. So those, there's three practical ways you can support the industry by not getting into beekeeping. Um, because, or, you know, if you are interested, I mean, it's not like I'm trying to discourage people by any stretch, but just come to understand a little bit about what's involved. Again, it's not a lot of work, but there is some work that you have to be on top of. It's not just set it up and hope for the best kind of thing and get honey for your toast uh, for breakfast kind of thing.
that was pretty exciting. So a few years ago, in just a former what a job that I had, I worked in in our in our town here. Uh, there's a, um, a satellite college from uh, it's Canada College, and what we brought there was um, because we had some space there, we we put an apiary there. And it was really, a, so APR being a collection of hives, <clears throat> which turned out to be a great community resource for a couple of different reasons. One, I mean, we, we taught our beekeeping course at Canador, so that was uh, part of our curriculum, which was great. We also tied it into so our, our main campus is a couple hours away, and they have a huge carpentry set up, so we built it into their curriculum, so we got them to make the beehives, the actual physical wooden boxes and the frames and things like that, so that was kind of fun. So through the curriculum of the carpentry course, they made these beehives that then we could sell, I mean, at a discount price to our community, so it was a great experience uh, for that. We also sent up the honey uh, that we got from our hive to the culinary program of the college, which was kind of cool as well to integrate in that we also used it as a local as mentioned a local resource for community so we'd had many uh, school groups uh, a bunch of the schools here are within walking distance so the school groups would walk over we would uh, do a little you know talking presentation first just to provide a little education about bees uh, their background and many of the things that we've talked about today and then uh, we would go out and look at the bees and we just uh, people would uh, have them. We wouldn't, we wouldn't open up the hives that I mentioned earlier, but just standing because you can stand just right beside a hive and watch the bees. And it's sort of like this mesmerizing, hypnotic, uh, soothing, zen experience. Just watching thousands of bees flying in and out of the hive. And then, of course, their favorite part was coming back in and then we did honey tasting. So that was kind of uh, you know, we'd get them all uh, wired up on sugar and then send them back to school. So that was kind of <laughs> fun. But we did that with a lot of different groups. That's similar kind of format, whether it be the Chamber of Commerce, Commerce or any. Uh, we had a couple of um, local groups uh, coming just as a fun staff activity. We also were able to use it to create um, a honey festival here in Perry Sound, which was pretty popular, where we had a couple hundred people come from all around Ontario. <clears throat> so we did a lot of the things I just described. The honey tasting we actually was pretty amazing because we had we had about thirty different honeys um, uh, for people to taste, and we had the local honey selection, so local beekeepers, and then we had a little wider Ontario uh, honey selection, and then we had international because I mean a lot of friends who know I'm in beekeeping if they've traveled somewhere they would see a little jar of honey and they were kind enough to bring me back uh, a, a jar of honey so and not surprisingly i mean honey is like wine and that uh, depends on the source the grapes and things like that and it does taste very different depending on um where where it came from and so we've used so and then we also did just for fun we did um, an airbnb experience where it was uh, bees birds and uh, beer so we if someone signed up for this airbnb experience There'd be an hour session around uh, birds, uh, and then we do an hour session on bees, and then they would end up down at the local brewery here and uh, try some beer. So that was a, a fun thing that we did. So it was a great community resource uh, and education piece uh, for our community and, and beyond, which was kind of fun. So that was my involvement with that. It was great. So in the, the typical hive, which is uh, those boxes, which you've seen some of the photos of, without too much work, a hive would produce about 30 to 40 liters of honey. So, so that's a lot of honey, uh, especially, I mean, I had to two or three hives, so 60 liters, you know, 90 liters of honey is, is more than one person needs. Uh, and so I have a lot of good friends who are happy that I'm a beekeeper, so I just give them a jar. I mean, I sell a few jars, but I mean, I'm, I'm doing it really just for fun and as a hobby. But beekeepers who are in it for, I mean, you can make, there's, um, there's th essentially three ways you can make money in beekeeping. I mean, there's others, but one of them is selling honey. And those, those producers, I mean, they've got thousands of hives. And they would do things a little differently, manage the beehives a little differently, because their goal is to maximize honey production. So, so there's just a few different things they would do. So that's one way you can make money. The other, the other way you can make money is uh, by through pollination. So in Ontario, for example, a lot of uh, bees <clears throat> get shipped out on a truck uh, out, out east to uh, the eastern provinces, and they, they're involved with pollination, 
which is um, for the blueberries. And then the third way you can make money, or primary way, is just by raising bees. So, you know, back to when you originally asked, how do you get them? Well, you become a bee breeder. Uh, so those are the three things. So it's, oh, again, I'm giving you always the long answers to your questions, but I mean, each hive can produce about 30 to 40 liters, and that's without much work. And then, but as you also noted, we're just trying to take a little bit. Basically, we, we got to make sure that they have enough uh, to get through the winter. Hazards are uh, the emotional turmoil that uh, you can have while you're caring about these bees and uh, this, I'll say the stress of that. I'm just wondering if they're going to live, if you're going to do any, everything right. Like my kids for a while thought that I liked my, the bees better than I liked them. So there's a lot of emotional attachment to the bees. Just want to make sure you do the right things and uh, to get them through the winter. I mean, the physical part, I mean, you, someone, oh, aren't you going to get stung by bees? Well, yeah, that happens. But I mean, on that note, let's just talk about that for a second. So honeybees, I mean, yes, they have a stinger. Actually, the males do not have a stinger. So that's always fun back to when we were the school kids. I would literally grab them, the male bee, and say, here, hold this bee. And you can hold them because they, they can't sting you. But a honeybee, they only, they only sting people under duress or it's like a last resort kind of kamikaze kind of thing. Because their stinger, it's got a little, um, little fish hook on it. Uh, like a barb so when they sting you uh, their bottom bit falls out so they they die so again it's a last resort kind of thing uh, as com as compared to like a wasp uh, and I mean that's one of the parts of our education is trying to, even that basic differential between what a wasp is and what a honeybee is and this this fundamental difference is stinging because a wasp uh, will sting you multiple times and I think smiles every time it does it uh, me, my, I've been stung by a wasp myself on my foot, and I mean it hurt for three days uh, because it was so it was so painful. I've been stung by honeybees, and it's typically um, it feels like a bad um, uh, like well, if you're getting a needle, there's an initial ouch that kind of hurts, but then it usually goes away uh, in about 10, 15 minutes. So I get stung sometimes if I'm because when I'm doing the inspection that I mentioned, I'm not wearing gloves. And the reason I'm not wearing gloves is because it's uh, it's easier to feel the frames and things like that, and also for infection control. And if my fingers, like I don't see a bee and I'm accidentally kind of squishing it, it's usually I'm getting stung because of something I did, not because of what the, the bees are, are doing. So, I mean, that is, uh, I mean, it's, uh, some people absolutely have allergic allergies to um, bees. I, I thankfully don't. So, I mean, that would be to answer your question of um, what would be a danger. I mean, if you're allergic uh, then beekeeping might not be the best thing you want to do. But I mean, you can, I mean, you can also still do it if you really wanted to with wearing the right equipment and things, things like that. So, but I think it, actually what I said, the first thing is <laughs> the, the emotional turmoil because beekeeping, while we know a lot about beekeeping, uh, part of the frustration, but also the magic and the mystery is uh, what we don't know about beekeeping. And it's, uh, that makes it uh, so engaging to be involved with. That's a big question. Uh, so it is also just as it's context dependent and country dependent and where you are in the world dependent about uh, how climate change can or cannot affect bees. And I mean, aside from, so to answer your question, I mean, where you potentially could see, if it, essentially it throws off the, 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 the cycle of the normal cycle of the bees. So, cause I often get asked, uh, well, do you, can you put your bees in uh, like a shed over winter, kind of keep them warm? Well, you could, but then what happens is um, it, it can potentially throw off their natural rhythm, their natural cycle. So in the global bigger context of climate change, if the seasons are changing, if the winters are longer or shorter, or, you know, they come out of their hive and there's no food around because of the change in the cycle due to climate, if the change is due to climate change, that's how it could potentially throw off the beekeepers. Now, you know, that said, I mean, they'll probably, they're pretty smart little creatures, so they'll probably figure it out. But if it, I guess if those, their ability to, to adapt to the new climate is uh, slower than how the climate's changing, then that could potentially be how <clears throat> they'll be affected by uh, the climate change.
Well, I haven't uh, planned to do photo shoots with the bead, but what I what I do do is uh, I'll just show you this. So every time after a client uh, leaves, they get a little they get a little uh, bring this up to they get a little jar of uh, honey, and it says it says uh, headshot honey. So I'm tying in my photography for with my uh, clients. So this is this is honey made from uh, Perry Sound's finest uh, honeybees. So that's how I tie it into my photography with regards to doing photo shoots. I mean, I'll probably just, I, I probably not. I mean, I just enjoy taking photos, uh, the bees for fun because it's fun. <laughs> I have had a few clients, um, uh, not, not during the session, but, you know, somehow we've talked about beekeeping. I have invited them to do, come and do a hive inspection with me after, like a couple, whenever it works for me and them. So I've, I've had clients do that, which uh, certainly they've enjoyed. Because I mean, obviously not everyone's interested in bees, but some people really are. And if I can provide that opportunity, that, that's worked out well. I'm just embracing the moment. Uh, I mean, yesterday I had some an opportunity to spend some time outside, just well, just putzing around in the garden. It's just uh, it's always very energizing. So I don't. It's not. Uh, I, I, I guess I haven't thought about it in that context of sort of like competing with each other. Really, it's just uh, enjoying the moments in in when I'm there and embracing both opportunities when I'm doing them. So it's uh, I don't look at so yeah. It's not really a competition in my mind. It's just. Uh, being involved with things that I like to do. In uh, well, beekeeping. I mean, the project is um, uh, just keeping my bees alive, which is a good pro good starting point, and then uh, just continuing the education process, uh, where we're just educating people as best I can about just some basics about beekeeping and what to, and there's a, thankfully there's another course that's happening that I'll be uh, co-facilitating with. So that's always fun to do. And just, uh, it's just always a joy to um, have bees and do the inspection. So nothing really major in, the, in that area. Uh, from a photography standpoint, it's uh, just continuing to grow my business and making a difference in uh, people's lives and how they feel about themselves. So that's just, I mean, number wise, it's just doing more photography. I'm hopefully doing, <clears throat> there's this project that I'm uh, hopefully going to be able to do in the fall where it's a complimentary thing, but there's an organization, they work with clients or community members that have uh, they're either born with or have uh, have had an accident. They've got something on their face. Uh, a facial facial difference is the term that they use. And you know, we are working towards providing an opportunity for those people to have their photo taken, which uh, is going to be pretty exciting, but also nerve wracking as well. Because going back to the example I talked about earlier, you know. And to repeat it, people don't like having their photo taken, and especially. I mean, I guess I don't. I haven't met them yet, so I don't want to make any assumptions. But if someone does have a facial difference, they may even less. They may even like having the photo taken less. But maybe they don't. So that's a just going to be a really interesting project from all kinds of levels uh, that I hope to be aside from doing the regular uh, photography uh, stuff that I did. Another thing we did last I did last year, which was. It turned out really kind of magical again as uh, my mom, she lives in a retirement home here uh, in Perry Sound. And uh, I s worked with um, one of the people there and said, hey, I'll do uh, like resident photo day, sort of like back to the day. Would you imagine remember back in high school or school, you had photo day, you know, put on a nice uh, some clothing, and do your hair and uh, do photo day. So we did this for uh, the residents uh, where my mom is a retirement home. And we did about 20 photos. And my, my wife was with me, in, which was help with logistics. But there's two elements that were really amazing about it. My wife was able to engage with them a little more just as they were waiting. But I had said, I don't know, do something like ask them a question about their past or something like that. It was just this. So she got these really rich stories about uh, their lives. And uh, and then I got to meet them and interact with them a little bit. And, you know, there was one lady in particular, she's 100 years old, and she was describing her she was born in Canada. She went over to England. She met this guy. Came back to Canada, and then she did, she was walking, describing the moment of when she was waiting in the harbor in Montreal, I think it was, and she was 20 at the time. So this is 80 years ago because she's 100, 
she was describing the moment that her boyfriend at the time got off the ship and the smile that she had on the face it was like it just was happening that day just the uh, the joy that it brought to her so we it was some really cool experiences to enjoy with her and then we took these photos of um probably as 20 25 people but what was great about it is uh, the families the feedback that i got from the families like having a really good photo of their mom or their dad uh it was really sort of uh was part of the reason I was doing it because a few years ago I finally wrangled my dad into my studio to take a photo of him I mean just for practice but also to have a good photo of my dad and my mom and uh, it was uh, shortly after that that he he passed away so I, I always thought well you know people it just you know we don't have a lot of great photos of our parents so I was really kind of motivated to do that at this retirement home so again, I'm pretty good at giving you long answers to your questions, but I hope to do that project. So those two projects, aside from the regular sort of headshot business, are things that uh, I hope uh, to do again this year because they're really meaningful um, or I found them to be really meaningful for the people involved. So th those are fun to be involved with. I'll say, I mean, I have. It's not like I've never, because I mean, I'm, uh, during summer vacations, we go, we've gone kayaking on Georgian Bay and certainly I've always had my camera with me and uh, I love to take photos of those too. That said, I mean, there's other photographers in Perry Sound here who take way better photos. And like any of the different genres of photography, to become really, I'm still trying to take a good photo of a person. So to, let alone to take a good photo of a sunset and things like that. I mean, I love taking uh, for sure. But uh, to really focus on to bring those to life is, I mean, it's just it's it's just more. Well, it's not. I don't want to make it sound like it's just time spent on learning that how to take a good photo of a, a sunset it's not just point and click uh kind of thing so and i'll say yes i love taking those photos but that's not my focus uh i mean i was just talking to a photographer the other day he takes photos at nighttime where he's capturing the stars milky milky way galaxy you know having them uh, juxtaposed to a building and then with that building then he's you know shining lights on the building so light painting is the terminology and then just the complexities involved with that, and then bringing it into the the behind the scenes editing of layering images thing of that it was fascinating, uh, but it's mind blowing for me because it's like I'm as I said I'm just trying to take a good photo of a human face, let alone all that stuff. I mean it's super fascinating, but it's just it's just time which you know maybe down the road I'll be getting more into that uh, as a master of this craft of headshot photography. For now, uh, I'm just focused on really learning how to take a good uh, good headshot of a person. I mean, I send out some basic uh, stuff, on, uh, you know, how to prepare for a headshot, uh, you know, things around clothing. I mean, just, at the end of the day, it's your photo, so you can do whatever you want. But I mean, to create some of the be better photos, it's a matter of clothing. For example, not wearing plaid, kind of being solid colors, uh, not a lot of jewelry. Uh, you know, your hair usually uh, as you wear it normally in makeup uh, for, well, I guess men or women is uh, just minimal uh, because my goal is to create an authentic, genuine photo of a person. It's not, I'm not looking to create a photo of, uh, you know, the ones you might see on some cover magazines or fashion magazines. That's, that's not what I'm taking, uh, taking, uh, I mean, and so to answer, so it's just, we give out some, or provide those, that kind of information, but uh I mean, it's all right to not want to have your photo taken. I mean, we're you're we're fifty fifty in the process of creating this. And they're engaged, and uh, I'm here to to create the experience. To have the technology and my professional experience, so that uh, at the end of the day, when they leave at the students, hey, they've had a great experience, and you know, positive experience. They feel good about it, and they've captured a great uh, photo. So, it's uh, it's fun.
Thank you.